It was Ian e. Bounds, a spiritual leader of the early part of the 20th century, who said, to pray is the greatest thing we can do, and do it well. There must be calmness, time, and deliberation. Almost a century prior to that, it was the evangelist D.L. Moody who said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher, which was rather remarkable, considering he was probably the greatest evangelist of his, of his time and of his era. He says, Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach. He only taught them how to pray. And then if we peel back history books a few centuries earlier, it was Martin Luther who wrote regarding prayer. So anything that is to be done well ought to occupy the whole individual with all of his faculties and members. As the saying goes, he who thinks of many things thinks of nothing and accomplishes no good. How much more must prayer possess the heart exclusively and completely if it is to be good prayer? Now, this goes without saying that uh, God's people are to be praying people. That, and the reason is, well, why? Well, first of all, prayer was a very essential part of the life of Jesus. We find him on many occasions praying publicly, praying quietly, praying at times all night, praying prior to the making of large decisions, such as the calling of disciples, and later the extended period of time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed. He prayed a lot. Even though he's the Son of God, he still prayed a lot. Prayer was then seen as a necessary skill in the life of the disciples. It's the only, in a sense, skill that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we find this. Uh, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples how to pray. Well, then it comes as no surprise in the book of Acts that prayer was a very significant thing of the life of the church. Acts chapter 1, you find the importance decision which is before them. Judas had committed suicide. Who is going to take his place? It was the disciples who prayed and asked for direction. Who should be that person that would, was to be selected? Then you find that there is an extended period of time, 10 days uh, until the day of Pentecost, that they were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. They were fasting and praying. And then you have the giving of the Holy Spirit. A few chapters later, chapter 5, you have Peter who is in prison. What does the church do? Well, they're gathering together. They pray. And what does God do? He acts. Peter is released. And then you come to chapter 13. You have the occasion of uh, the church now spread to outside of Israel, to out of Judea, to Antioch. And the disciples there are giving themselves to fasting and prayer. And then the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to do. See, there's this pattern, this rhythm, which is there regarding prayer. It's, it's so much part of the life of the church. It, it's indispensable from the life of those who are Christ, Christ followers. In a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about three areas in terms of our own personal development. Chapter 6, he talks about, first four verses, he talks about the whole idea of, of giving, and how much that is part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. And then he talks about prayer, verses 5 through 15. He talks about how important that is in our lives. And we're going to talk about that more in a few moments, how we not to pray and how we need to pray. And then this whole idea of fasting, the whole idea of setting aside things that otherwise distract us so we could focus our hearts on who Jesus is and what he is doing. But it is interesting that Jesus assumes that this is these three areas, these are things that his disciples are going to, to do. It's kind of part of our DNA. In other words, it's not, he's not saying do this, but he rather puts it in the phrase, the assumption is we're doing these things. When you give to the needy, verses 2 and 3. When you pray, verses 5, 6, and 7. When you fast, verses 16 and 17. That these are things which are assumed that we are doing. When it comes to prayer, 
interestingly, Jesus talks a lot about how we are not to do this, how we are not to pray. So we pick up the story in chapter 6, verse 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in their synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in truth, in full. But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen, and your father who is, sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you do pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of the many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows that you need even before you ask him. And so Jesus really spends a lot of time, and his disciples understood quite well, how not to pray. Prayer, prayer was always a very, very important part of the life of the, of the pious Jew at the time of Jesus, that it was commended, it was seen as being honorable, it was seen as a duty which was there. But the sad thing was it, it, it really turned, came off the tracks in terms of what it was intended to accomplish. History tells us that prayer tended to be very quite formalized. One of the things that was prayed what was known as the Shema. The Shema comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, which reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments I give to you today will be on your shoulders. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at your home or when you walk along the road and when you lie down when you get up. Tie them on the symbols of your hands. Bind them on your foreheads, write them on the doorposts of your house, upon your gates. A similar elaboration of, thing, of the same prayer was given in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 to 21, and then again in Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 to 41. And this became, not wrongfully, but it, it became the sum and substance of part of the formalized prayer of the pious Jew at the particular time, and they would repeat this again and again. They would, they would do so verbatim. In a sense, nothing wrong with that, but what does become wrong with that is that having done often enough, it becomes rote, it becomes memorized, it becomes something we just do quickly because we're going to get through it, and it becomes less and less meaningful, which is there. There was a daily repetition as well of another set of prayers known as the, the 18. These later became 19 prayers, but they still obtained the attitude of the 18. And these were 18 prayers that the rabbis had written up for people to pray. Not necessarily anything wrong about a written prayer, but when the heart is no longer in it, and we're simply doing things again and again on the habit, it loses its meaning. And so we find in addition to there being structured prayer, there was a liturgy of supplied prayers for all occasions, all situations had prayers which were associated with them. The expectation was that if you're going to travel, you have a certain type of prayer. If you have a meal, you have a certain type of prayer. If you have a crisis, an illness, or things like that, there's another certain type of prayer which is there. Instructional purposes, not necessarily bad, but when repeated without, in a sense, having been, it's not the heart, it doesn't do much good. There was then that the tendency to connect prayer with certain places, namely the, the local synagogue and the temple and in Jerusalem. Prayers tended to be long and formalized, which was there. One can surmise that there was a type of prayer language. And just to be sensitive here, sometimes individuals feel they have to have their own prayer language. They revert to King James, Elizabethan in English, might I say this, if that is meaningful for you and if that is your heart language when you pray and if you feel anything other than that is not being respectful, then you should do that. That is the language which is there. But if you are doing that to make an impression upon others, it becomes problematic because the Bible was not written in Elizabethan English. It was written in Koine Greek and Hebrew and the vernacular of the common people which was there. It was not formal. 
in any capacity. It was very personal, and that's how it was written. More than that, there became the structure of the times of prayers at nine o'clock in the morning, at noon, three o'clock in the afternoon. Times of prayers, not all like that, unlike what is practiced in Islam today. A discipline was that when it came those times of prayer, you stopped everything, wherever it was, whatever you were doing, you would face toward Jerusalem and you would pray. There would be prayers which would then be highly repetitious, repeating, as we noted earlier, the scripture or the rabbinic prayers, doing them again and again. And the sad thing was, and this is what Jesus was talking about, it was done with the intent of simply making an impression upon others. It wasn't praying for the benefit of having one's heart poured out before God. It was prayed for the purpose of making a good impression upon other people. And Jesus says, when you pray, and three times he says, when you pray, when you pray, don't be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites who stand in the synagogues and the street corners to be seen by men. Don't be like them. Go to your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is in heaven. When you pray, don't be like those who are the non-Jews, the pagans, who just keep somehow thinking that if we have enough content, if our prayers go long enough. Remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, how they had question was, who's God? You have this whole battle, as it were, which is going on. And the priests of Baal prayed from earliest of morning till way in the afternoon, thinking, okay, if we talk long enough, loud enough, repetitious enough, maybe we will get his attention, he'll answer us. And Jesus says, don't be like them. Don't be like individuals who think that they have to grab God's attention, that they have to implore him from his distractions to listen to you. Don't don't imagine that God is so busy he doesn't care about you. This is not the God who you serve. This is not my Father who is in heaven. Don't pray in that way. Don't succumb to those temptations which, which are there. But rather, when you pray, and the assumption is you are praying. This is part of your life. This is part of your daily discipline. It might be a quiet time. It might be time that you set aside in the morning. It might be times in which you're driving and you turn off the radio and you have a marvelous conversation with the Father. It might be times in which you gather together with precious other believers to come together to pray. When you pray. And he gives to us what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. Some dispute that, call it the, the Disciples' Prayer. It really doesn't matter what you call it. What it is, it is a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. I don't think there's anything inappropriate about praying it collectively. It could be a very powerful act of worship. But it also becomes for us instrumental in helping us to understand what is to help drive the content of what we pray. In other words, if we're going to talk to God, what are we going to pray about? Well, here Jesus says, if you're going to talk with my Father in heaven, this is what you need to talk about. These are the things which are important for you to bring to the Father. First of all, you need to recognize he's your Father. Pray this way, our Father in heaven. What a marvelous statement. I, I realize in a sense fatherhood is hugely in disrepute and individuals recoil at that because they had a bad fathering experience and that is most tragic. Not all fathers are bad people. We have a heavenly father who's infinitely good and loving. And when we come to understand him as a loving father, we understand that he is the one who helps us to it settle the, our relationship with the unseen world. We know who God is. We know that he is kind, and loving, and merciful, and, and cares, and is compassionate upon us. Ends the speculation that is in competing religious systems of being either a multiplicity of gods or a God who is vengeful and vindictive and merciless 
but rather is merciful and kind and compassionate. It settles our relationship with a seen world. We have a father who loves and cares for us and provides for us in the midst of a, of a hostile world. And that should give us all a great amount of ease, compassion, obviously. The world in which we live, both because of the pandemic and racial unrest and political upheaval, it's, it's tumultuous. It's tumultuous. And frankly, it's not going to become any less tumultuous in any time in the foreseen future. But what Jesus says is this. We have a father who's much bigger than this, who loves and cares for us, fully in charge of the world in which we live, and we can live without any fear or anxiety which was there. This settles not only a relationship with the seen and the unseen world, it settles our relationship with one another. Notice how Jesus teaches us to pray. He begins with the plural pronoun, our, which is most remarkable because when Jesus prayed directly to the Father, we spoke about his relationship with the Father. He would talk about first person, I or my, or in his capacity with the Father. But when he, when he taught his disciples to pray, he says, no, you don't use the first person pronoun. You use the first person plural, our Father. We're in this together. We share a relationship with a loving Father. None of us have an exclusive relationship with God. None of us have a superior relationship with him. We come equal individuals into his presence. We share his love. He shares his love with us. We share our love with one another. He teaches us to pray, our Father. And finally, teaching us to pray and understand the Father with this settles our relationship with God. We know who he is. We belong. If we call him Father, Acknowledge him as Lord. There's one God and Father, Lord and Lord, Jesus Christ. And he welcomes us. It settles it. We belong. We're welcomed into his presence. We come into his presence recognizing that he is a holy God. He is both of all residing in heaven, which is his throne room. And then we say, may your name be holy. What does that mean? Hallowed be your name. May you, O oh God, be honored and exalted and worshiped for who you are. And yet recognizing that he is greater than all the things that we experience or encounter in life. And it, it settles our relationship when we understand who he is and how we refer to him. And so his name is to be held sacred because he is sacred and holy. The use of his name and our reference to him reflects and should reflect that of respect and awe. So consequently, he's not the man upstairs or the guy on top or whatever it might be. He is not the spirit in the sky. No, that's not who he is. He's our father in heaven. His name is holy and sacred, and he has invited us to share in his holiness as he calls us his saints. We ask that we, we do his will. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. There's a lot of discussion about the kingdom in the Old Testament. There's a lot of discussion about the kingdom which is to come when Jesus Christ returns. But what Jesus is talking about here is the kingdom of God which exists now. Well, where does it reign? What, what Jesus said as he began his, his ministry in, in Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God is near. To the disciples later on, he said, the kingdom of God is among you. He said to the little children, Don't, do not prohibit them from coming, to, for to them belongs the, the kingdom of God. What, what is this whole notion of, of the kingdom? Well, it's understood in the same verse, because what we have here is a, a type of prayer, which is known as it's a parallelism, and that is that the, the, the following term describes the first term. And so Jesus says this, 
pray in this way your kingdom come present tense now here among us your kingdom come into our lives into our church into our families into our community and then he describes what that means your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven raises the interesting question what is the kingdom of god as william barclay defined it rather succinctly this way he says this the kingdom of god is a society on earth where god's will is perfectly done as it is in heaven well where is that to be well it is to be in the life of his followers which we know as his church and really that's what jesus says i want you to be concerned about primarily that my will is done amongst my people yes we have an influence on the world we're the salt of the earth yes we have a responsibility of the world we are a light of the world but we are not responsible to make the world live in the way we want them to we are responsible to make sure that we live in the way that god wants us to your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and then through us that kingdom is spreads and it has influence and it does influence society and society is better much better because of christ followers hospitals are built schools are constructed orphans are welcomed elderly are protected individuals who are otherwise disenfranchised because of their race or economic status they're loved and protected and welcomed and included that's kingdom kingdom work marvelous great privilege and jesus says pray that god's kingdom god's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven you, you see the whole notion of parallelism it shows up a lot of times in the psalms a couple of illustrations examples are this psalm 46 verse 1 god is our refuge and strength and then it defines it an ever-present help in time of trouble psalm 23 verse 1 the Lord is my shepherd. Parallelism. I will not be in want. Helps us to understand what the scriptures are talking about. We pray that God's will would be done in our lives. It's interesting that the first of the declarations have to do with God and his will and his purpose. The last have to do with ourselves. The fourth one, their declaration of dependency. Give us this day our daily bread what is that all about we have jobs we have social security we have pension plans what's this whole notion about bread and that kind of thing what what is it talking about what are the implications of it which was there bread was seen as always the sustenance of life it was one of the mainstays which were there 40 years in the wilderness what did god provide for his people manna a form of bread to sustain them what does this passage tell us, this, this, this statement which is there? It tells us, first of all, that, that our bodies are good. Our bodies are good. They're not evil. They're good. And God cares about our body, cares about our physical needs. And he, he recognizes in the sense that three times a day, which is our, our practice, sometimes some societies pre eat more times. It doesn't really matter. What it says is that our bodies need to be nourished and nurtured and cared for, even cherished. Why? Because they're a place where God lives by his spirit. And they're a gift from God. And God has declared all things good. And so when we ask for the things which sustain us, we're asking for something which is which is good. But also tells us that we we live one day at a time. We really do. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know when calamity, which is there. We don't know when rapid change is going to catch us up and things and take us to places we really don't want to go. But as a reminder, we live one day at a time. 
and we do so in the confident dependence by God providing. And so consequently, we don't have to worry about the future. We don't have to be anxious about uncertainty. We pray, give us today, O oh God, what we need, our daily bread. It reminds us that our loving Father provides for us the proper place and the time he provides all that we need. It reminds us as well that we're active participants, even in the answers to our prayer. Lord, give me, give me a job. Well, if that's the case, don't expect someone can come knocking in your door. Go out and apply for a job, which is there. It requires us to do the work which is necessary. Hebrew culture at the time was an agricultural society. And that is that most individuals worked in the fields, they worked in the vineyards, they worked tending sheep, they worked taking care of things which really provided sustenance. There was very little opportunity for saving or planning for the future. Retirement wasn't anything they had any knowledge of, which was there. You, you worked, you worked something until you could have worked no more. But was a life of work which was confident dependence upon God to provide for our needs. It reminds us finally as well that we do life together. Give us, not me, give me, no, give us our daily bread. That God has called his people to live in community and mutual interdependence caring for, providing for, when necessary, one another, so that we can feel, be confident which is there. Then talks about the need of forgiveness. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Or so forgive us our debts as those who have been indebted to us. And the whole thing is here is that we are individuals who find ourselves needing to experience forgiveness. We need to experience the loving grace of God, which is there. Now, let me kind of sort some terms out a little bit for us, because we've read this passage, and we see it as trespasses, we see it as debts. Well, the reality is there's a variety of words which are commonly translated sin, but sin is described in a wide variety of ways in the New Testament. In one part, sin is described as a shortcoming, a missing of the mark, the most common term, hamatea. Actually, it's an archery term. You, you missed a bullseye. You missed. You might have been well-intentioned, but you, you missed, and all of us have missed and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is also known as overstepping a boundary, parabasis, which is there, commonly translated transgression. You know that in a sense, perhaps best by property rights. You own home, you have property rights. If somebody comes into your property uninvited, unwanted, they are trespassing. They've gone to a place where they shouldn't be going. And there are consequences to that. If you go in those particular places, God gives clear direction. He sets up boundaries. He sets up lines, which is there. When we look at the line and we deliberately step across it, intentionally, is a trespass. Third, which was used, it's slipping into a place of peril or danger. Paraptoma is the word which is there. And that is, go too close to the edge, you come too close to areas of temp temptation. If you come too close to a, a cliff, and all of a sudden you realize that the, the rubble you stepped on is giving away, you're, you're slipping. And you're in danger, you're falling. And frankly, if it's a steep enough precipice, it could kill you. So is true with sin. We get too close to the edge. We get too close to places where we shouldn't be. We linger too long, and we can slip, and we can fall. There's another aspect of sin, and that is simply being a lawless person, disregarding the things which we know to be true. Another Greek word which is there translated lawlessness commonly is called anomia. 
meaning no law. Namia, nomia, mean for law, put an A privative before it, it nullifies it, anomia. You see that sadly in our cities, people act lawlessly and it's chaotic, it's dangerous. People are hurt and they suffer because of lawlessness. None of those words were used here. The word which Jesus used interestingly is the word aptholemina. It's used really to describe a debt. In other words, if I break something you have, I owe you something. If I have taken something which you have, I owe you something. If I offend you, I owe you. I owe you an apology, which is there. This is the word that Jesus used. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us in the way in which we have wronged other individuals. Forgive us a way in which, God, we have wronged you. And we need enable, like well, forgive us as we forgive. If we're going to be forgiven, we need to be forgiving. Jesus links the two together. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and forgive our debtors as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Jesus links them together on other occasions and basically says this, if you're unwilling to forgive, you won't be forgiven. Strong motivation, which is there. And then what about difficult times? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's basically a prayer, a request to stay strong in the times of testing and difficulty. It's not that God leads us into places of temptation. The reality is we simply walk into them. But there's things which are really are double entendres, which are there. The Greek word, which is commonly understood as temptation, is the word parasmos. The Greek word, which is primarily translated for testing, is parasmos. They're two of the same things. We find ourselves coming into difficult times. Sometimes those times are temptation to take shortcuts, to do things which are uh, wrong. It is both a temptation to do evil. It's also a test to see how good we're going to be in the midst of those things. And what the prayer basically says is this, God, help us to be strong when these times come. We often aren't prepared for them. We many times don't recognize them. Help us to be prepared. Help us to recognize them. That when we come and we are tempted to do what is wrong, we recognize that you are testing us to see if we are loyal to you. Enable us to be that loyal to you, that loyal person to you and to you alone. Some manuscripts add the word, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Most of the most oldest of manuscripts don't have that. But it's a good reminder that prayer always needs to focus upon God's kingdom and his power and his glory. To find our satisfaction in him and to him alone. Jesus wants us to be praying people, people who pray from the heart, people who have a language of praying from things which are upon us for his glory, for his kingdom, for his purposes, that we might be individuals who are prepared, healed, made whole, made strong for whatever is before us. We can do this.